Steve Spurrier made a whole lot of enemies in his two decades as a head coach in college football. But when it came to Tennessee, the school he grew up two hours away from, there was something special about his antagonism. As a senior at Science Hill High School in 1963, Spurrier was a multi-sport star. In three years as a starting pitcher, he never lost an outing. He was the starting point guard on the team that won its conference championship. Oh, and yeah, he was also named All-State in football. Now, Science Hill is in Johnson City, about 100 miles away from the University of Tennessee in Knoxville, and Spurrier says that's where he saw his first ever college football game when he was 10 years old. Naturally, Tennessee offered Spurrier a scholarship for basketball. See, the Volunteers were running a single wing offense at the time, and they ran the ball three times as often as they passed it. That didn't really fit Spurrier's skill set, so he decided to look elsewhere. Ole Miss was a leading contender until Florida coach Ray Graves got a note from his brother Edwin, who was the postmaster in Knoxville. A few recruiting visits later, Spurrier decided to go to UF. That decision worked out for Steve, but he never had to face his home state's flagship football program as a player. So let's jump all the way to 1982, when Spurrier was the offensive coordinator at Duke. Duke opened that season on the road in Knoxville as a slight underdog, and they won after Spurrier put in the backup QB after just one quarter. A couple weeks later, some Tennessee boosters were rumoredly looking to get Spurrier to replace Johnny Majors as head coach at Tennessee, and Spurrier sounded like he'd welcome the opportunity. But it wasn't until 1987 that Spurrier would get his first head coaching job in college, back at Duke. And in his second season, he found himself in the familiar position of leading the Blue Devils into Neyland Stadium. Just as they'd done in 1982, Duke won. And just as they had in 1982, rumors about Spurrier taking a new job started swirling. Though this time they included Florida as well as Tennessee. He'd stay with Duke for one more season, but in 1990, Spurrier decided to go back to Gainesville. This is where we should probably establish what these two programs were at the time. The Volunteers had five national titles and 10 SEC championships to their name. The Gators had no championships and had just been sanctioned by the NCAA. Tennessee had 11 seasons in program history with double digit wins. Florida didn't have any. And in Spurrier's first UFUT game, that imbalance showed as Tennessee beat Florida 45 to three, still the most lopsided game between these two schools. So far, Spurrier, Tennessee wasn't that beefy of a beef, but that changed in 1991 thanks to Kinko's. Before the game that year, reports surfaced that Jack Sells, a former UT assistant who'd been accused of NCAA violations and fired, had faxed Tennessee game plans to Florida defensive coordinator Ron Zook. Zook and Spurrier didn't deny that some faxing had happened, but they said Sells had just sent some newspaper clippings. After Florida beat Tennessee by three scores, Spurrier had some interesting praise for his defense. We've gained a little ground here and there. Coach Ron Zook had a super defensive plan oh. for him. Then it came out that Sells had sent way more than newspaper clippings to Zook. But Florida insisted they hadn't looked at the play diagrams and that they certainly hadn't needed them to win. Volunteer fans accepted this as truth and moved on. No, I'm, I'm kidding. They assumed Florida was a bunch of cheaters and one punch sells in the face shortly after the loss. When the teams faced off in 1992, Tennessee had a new leader, interim head coach Phil Fulmer. He'd stepped in just before the season after Johnny Majors needed quintuple bypass surgery and Fulmer had already beaten Georgia on the road. Philip Fulmer, who took over and is now the interim coach as Johnny Majors recovers from heart surgery. Keep that name in mind. Philip Fulmer someday will get an opportunity as a head coach. Did Florida take advantage of the upheaval or a Tennessee defense that had allowed 569 yards to Georgia? Nope. Spurrier's Gators got absolutely pantsed. Now we had a narrative. Florida can't win, can't even really compete, when they have to play in Knoxville. Arguably, this was more than just a win for Phil Fulmer. It was a career changer. Majors came back to the team after this game, but before the season was done, Tennessee decided to buy out his contract and made Fulmer the head coach full time. So let's jump ahead a bit to 1995. UT came to Gainesville having lost the last two games of the rivalry, but they had a new exciting weapon, sophomore QB Peyton Manning. And in the first half, he looked ready to get Tennessee their first road win against Florida since 1971. This was also good for Sports Illustrated, who had sent a writer and photographer to shadow Peyton for two weeks leading up to this game. 
But Spurrier, cocky as ever, wasn't worried, telling the Gators at halftime he felt they could still score every time they got the ball. And then they did. Seven touchdowns on eight possessions. The only time UF didn't score was when they kneeled to end the game. And it's the most points by a Spurrier team. Who made the SI cover the following week? Florida QB Danny Werfel, who'd set the SEC record for touchdown passes in a game. Florida won the rematch in Knoxville the next year and went on to win the SEC and national titles. For four straight seasons, the Gators had finished first in the SEC East and the Vols had finished second. For four straight seasons, this game, played in September, had effectively decided the fate of each team for the rest of the year. In his off-season tour of Florida's booster club, Steve Spurrier decided to have a little fun at Tennessee's expense. You can't spell citrus without UT. Peyton Manning came back because he wanted to be a three-time star of the Citrus Bowl. I heard they just hung a sign outside the Citrus Bowl, winter home of the Tennessee Volunteers. This is why Spurrier drove opposing fans insane. His jokes and digs were always kind of based in truth. Sports Illustrated decided to put Manning on the cover ahead of the Florida-Tennessee game this time. Vol fans needed this win for themselves, for Fulmer, for Peyton. They didn't get it, and Spurrier pointed out that UT's deep, desperate need to beat Florida was part of what made denying them victory so enjoyable. Put yourself in Tennessee's shoes here. The best player in school history has just gone 0 for 3 against this visor-wearing jackass who's taken Florida from minor relevance to regular domination. His players are bold enough to say you can't beat them, and then they wind up being right. That sucks! For the record, Florida, not Tennessee, wound up going to the Citrus Bowl that year. And yeah, Spurrier brought that up in 1998. He also wasn't talking as much, maybe because he was worried about Florida's situation at quarterback and their kicking game. And Tennessee weirdly didn't seem freaked out without Peyton. In fact, some players thought playing without him was actually an advantage. Once again, Steve Spurrier proved to be a prophet. This game came down to a field goal, and that was not good for the Gators. Look at these fans swarming the field. That's five years of angst and frustration they're taking out on those goalposts. And none of them know it yet, but the Vols just took one major step towards winning their first national championship in over 30 years. Phil Fulmer? Completely stoked to finally end this streak. You got that Florida monkey off your back now? That monkey's gone too. There's one more Florida Tennessee game I want to revisit. It's the 2001 edition, which got delayed all the way to the end of the regular season because of the September 11th attacks. Tennessee admitted that was actually kind of good for them, but most of the national media thought Florida was going to win, probably easily. And even though this was the last game on the schedule instead of one of the first, the stakes were still exactly the same. Winner was going to be SEC East champion and in the hunt for the national title. Loser got second place. Tennessee had never beaten Spurrier in Gainesville. They'd never even had the lead in the fourth quarter. Didn't matter. Tennessee ran all over the Gators, spoiling what wound up being Steve Spurrier's final game at the Swamp. A month later, Florida found itself searching for a head coach for the first time in two decades. His Tennessee counterpart had kind words about the news. Though by the time the next Tennessee-Florida game came around, he admitted he wouldn't totally miss Spurrier. And that could have been it. Spurrier could have enjoyed a long and fruitful NFL career, and Tennessee could have enjoyed life without all of his shit-talking. If you're an NFC East fan, you know that's not how it worked out. After two lackluster years in Washington, Spurrier resigned. A year later, he was back in the SEC East, this time with South Carolina. And it only took a few months for Spurrier to start throwing barbs in the direction of Knoxville once again. Before Spurrier's arrival, the Volunteers had beaten the Gamecocks 12 straight times and never lost to them at home. Oh, they were also retiring Peyton Manning's jersey before this game. You can kind of see where this one's going, right? Spurrier was mostly more mellow at South Carolina, though sometimes he couldn't resist temptation. Fulmer's teams won the next two years, but in 2008 he brought a 3-5 Tennessee team to Columbia. And he took a 3-6 team out of it. This is the last time these two would shake hands as rival head coaches. Two days later, Fulmer announced he'd be stepping down at the end of the year. Now, Steve Spurrier had two responses to this news, one expected and one not. First, he got some ribbing in about this being a hell of a lottery ticket for Fulmer. Second, he said, and who knows if it's true, that if the Tennessee job had been open when he'd left the NFL, he might have taken it. Spurrier wound up going 3-3 three three against Tennessee in the rest of his time in Columbia. And while he still got to have some fun at UT's expense about their struggles to find coaching consistency or to win lots of games, the venom really wasn't the same. 
We were seven and six, the same as Tennessee and the same as Arkansas. And uh, I think they're sort of celebrating big seasons last year. Uh, so we were celebrating also. Still, I'm stuck on that idea of Steve Spurrier taking the field in Knoxville to cheers. What would that even sound like? This year's winner is Steve Spurrier. Yep, that happened. Granted, it's Spurrier receiving the Robert Neeland Award in 2016, but still weird, right? Maybe Steve Spurrier really did just love being a smartass and winning. Maybe the football team he grew up cheering for was just a victim of circumstance. Maybe, just maybe, there's an alternate timeline where Steve Spurrier, Tennessee coaching legend, is the most hated man in Gainesville. Thanks for watching Beef History, and I hope you learned a lesson from this episode. It's not okay for adults to make fun of teens for failing, unless they're college athletes.